If you were a stomped out peasant whose only chance at the good life was passing a series of challenges called The Process, what would you do? We'll be tested on everything from our ability to stack little tyke's brainy blocks to recruiting a child's sacrifice from a mother grieving her daughter's death. 3% of candidates make it to the fabled utopia called Offshore, where there's a good chance their organs are harvested for the elites. The rest that survive return to eke out a meager existence in the slums. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made by our candidates, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the elimination games in 3%. Candidate Michelle leaves her neighborhood in a giant cattle call of a thousand eligible young people, all excited for their chance to change their lives by moving to the offshore. We're introduced to several hopeful candidates, including Michelle's neighbor Bruna, an overly optimistic guy named Alex, a guy in a wheelchair named Fernando, the equivalent of slum royalty Marco, and a standoffish girl named Joanna. At orientation, the process leader Ezekiel welcomes them, telling them that only 3% of the candidates in the room will make it through the process, but if they do, they earned it. They deserve to be offshore, and if they don't make it, Ezekiel tells them they deserve that too. Their first challenge is an interview with one of the process counselors. It becomes obvious very quickly that this is no ordinary interview, as the first question Michelle is asked is about going on a date with the guy once she gets to offshore. Joanna's interviewer asks about her dirty hair, and Fernando is interrogated about how much he loves his religious father. Michelle's guy accuses her of trying to reach offshore because an old boyfriend made it through the year before. When Marco is asked what his greatest weakness is, he says that he cares too much about other people. His interviewer likes that answer. Other candidates are eliminated for sounding like they're trying to win a Miss America pageant. This girl's about as vague as a stoner with a laser point. And Alex is eliminated for talking the counselor's ear off without saying anything original. Of our six original candidates, five make it through. One challenge down, eight to go. I know I say this a lot, but seriously, staying home to game is a proven strat for staying alive. I'd recommend downloading the mobile game Star Trek Fleet Command with my link in the description below. Star Trek Fleet Command is a free-to-play open-world MMO game that will put your skills and strategies to the test. They just launched a new expansion, the Star Trek Lower Deck Story Arc. Commanders can now unlock a new ship, new ways to strengthen their crew, and three brand new officers. Mariner, Boimler, and Badgy. For the first time in 2D, the new ship, the USS Cerritos, is epic. It allows players to buff the rest of the ships in their fleet. This buff is a Swiss army knife that will improve over time, letting players increase damage, penetration, mitigation, and shields. There's a lot of fun game mechanics. You can craft a powerful ship by unlocking unique models and upgrading equipment. Assemble an away team by sending officers on expeditions to acquire new resources and develop new new improvements. Work with your alliances to battle alongside your allies to capture territory, pool resources, and dominate the multi-universe. Build your base and upgrade your space station to maximize your resources and efficiency. Earn faction reputation among the Federation, Romulans, Klingons, Rogues, and Augments to unlock unique ship characters. And you can't forget the notable characters like Kirk, Spock, Picard, and Worf. Download Star Trek Fleet Command and showcase your unique gameplay using my link in the description below. Thanks to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. This isn't the interview round at Miss America pageant. This is more like interviewing to work for Patrick Bateman. They're prodding the candidates for emotional weaknesses and sensitive spots. They're trying to eliminate desperation. As with Marco and Joanna, it doesn't really seem to matter if you're arrogant or aloof, just that you're confident and unaffected by their attempt to upset you. As we learn later, this test to reach offshore is in its 104th cycle, which means everyone they grew up with in the neighborhood failed their test at one point or another. Each of these candidates should have been asking their neighbors when they were eliminated and learning from their mistakes. We later learn that a vigilante called The Old Man trained Michelle for a year to be the process. She orchestrated every emotional beat in her interview to pass. If she can do that, so can you. However, if you fail to prepare properly for the interview portion of this test, one other strategy to use is to mirror your 
your interviewer's body language. What you say only accounts for 7% of your communication. 55% of your communication is through body language, and you can improve your chances in an interview by watching how your interviewer moves and mirroring it subtly. Slow your breathing down, remain calm, and keep your hand gestures small, and gauge your interviewer's reaction to what you're saying. Reinforce positive reactions and ignore negative ones. Once you've mastered the art of body language, the game makers move you on to the serious tests, like how good are you at stacking kindergarten blocks. After a portion of the candidates are eliminated, the rest are scanned for the identity chips behind their ears. Joanna notices that the guy ahead of her, Raphael, has a different chip sewn into his ear by the scar, and playfully warns him that he's going to get caught. They're both hustled into the second challenge along with the other candidates. Their counselor tells the group that this challenge evaluates their spatial logic, geometric reasoning, and basic motor skills. They're presented with a heap of Tetris-style blocks on a table, and told that they'll have three minutes to assemble nine cubes. If they build fewer than nine cubes, they'll be eliminated. The timer starts, and candidates scramble for blocks. Michelle helps Fernando reach the blocks, angering the other players. As the countdown ends, two players, Michelle and Raphael, have only built eight cubes. At the last second, Raphael steals a cube from his neighbor. Meanwhile, Fernando helps Michelle by forming one large cube out of Michelle's eight. The time runs out and the proctor counts their cubes. Raphael passes with a stolen cube. Fernando passes with nine cubes. Joanna passes with 11 cubes. Michelle also passes since her eight cubes stacked into one large cube counts as nine. We can assume Bruna passed as well. Our five remaining candidates all move on with seven challenges left to go. Three minutes to build nine cubes means you have just 20 seconds to build each one. Not much room for error or panicky feelings. Every single one of these candidates should have heard of this challenge from failed candidates before they arrived. If I'd grown up knowing that this was coming, I would have practiced in my spare time, with bricks or wood or even drawing out the shapes and fitting them together. If you failed to adequately prepare for this challenge, then your best bet is to focus on building the simplest cubes possible. Three U-shaped blocks and three t shaped shaped blocks will quickly fit together to make a cube, as well as three long L-shaped blocks and three short straight-shaped blocks. So pull as many of those blocks toward you as you can and then form your first cubes. You should be able to form at least a handful of cubes very quickly with this method. You might tap out all those pieces, especially once others see your strategy. In this case, we need to build one cube, remember the build order, immediately grab the same set of blocks for each of the remaining cubes that we need to build so nobody takes a crucial piece we need, then repeats our first cube. Technically, you should be able to build more than nine cubes, like Joanna does. At that point, you're safe, so your extra cubes become friendship building gifts to earn you brownie points with other players. Of course, don't let the other players sabotage you. Guard your nine cubes with your life, but if you have the chance to be Fernando, don't be a Raphael. As for Fernando forming Michelle's eight cubes into one big one, this could easily have backfired, since technically it is one cube. But since it was her own only chance he did her a solid. The fact that this strategy and Raphael's stealing worked tells us a really important strategy for the rest of the tests. Cheating does not get you disqualified. The test admins don't care how you pass the test, just that you pass it. Of course, sabotage should be a last resort, as it's going to make you an easy target moving forward. A dangerous thing in a series of tests where sabotaging others is allowed. In a new twist, Michelle and Bruna are separated from the other candidates, as potential moles for the resistance group back home called The Cause. The head of security brings them to a ventilation room and says that one of them is a mole and that one of them must confess or both of them will die. Michelle begs Bruna to come clean, but Bruna claims she's innocent. Michelle convinces Bruna to help her attack the interrogator and run away, but then lets Bruna attack by herself. Bruna is killed and takes the fall as the mole. Later, we learn Michelle trained to beat the process because Ezekiel killed her brother. Honestly, this is pretty brilliant strategizing, but also sociopathic considering she's known Bruna literally her entire life. It takes the suspicion off herself while giving the elite someone else to blame. The other option here is to throw suspicion on another candidate. If I were Michelle, I would accuse a player that's already been eliminated and lie about why she suspects them. For example, if she told the admin that she overheard Alex talking about being part of the cause before he killed himself, they wouldn't be able to confirm or deny that it's true. This is a situation of he said, she said. 
Maybe they kill you anyway, maybe they believe you, but at least you don't have to throw your oldest friend under the bus. The third challenge offers the players the best chance to find allies. In this test, groups are put into a fake apartment setting with mannequins arranged at a dinner table. The administrator tells them to figure out what happened to the woman in navy blue, then press the comm button and explain their interpretation of the scene. We learn that more than half of all candidates are eliminated through this challenge, and almost immediately after the exercise starts, there's an announcement saying that once team has already been eliminated. Fernando comes up with a plausible solution. He says the woman in navy blue was poisoned by the hostess because she was cheating with the hostess's husband. He knows this because the blue woman is the only one with sauce on her plate, and instead of reaching out to her husband, she reaches out to the hostess's husband. Plus, the hostess has a bland, unworried expression on her face. Raphael counters with a completely different scenario. He says the blue woman is freaking out because she's allergic to silver. She's reaching for the hostess's husband because he's a doctor. He knows this because the blue woman is the only one not wearing any metal jewelry, and they find medical illustrations in the apartment. When asked about the hostess's calm facial expression, Joanna points out that she's blind. As evidence, they find a book in braille, and she notes the hostess's side of the desk doesn't have a lamp on it. They submit the answer, and it's correct, but the one player in the room who didn't contribute is eliminated. Our five candidates escape elimination yet again, and that's three challenges down with six to go. Before anyone starts theorizing about the scene at the dinner table, they need to be searching the room for contextual information about the people at the table and sharing it with the group. If they had opened drawers in the kitchen and office areas before assuming anything, they would have learned that at least one person at the table is likely a doctor, thanks to the anatomical charts, and another is likely blind, thanks to the book and braille. Then it's time to point out clues in the dining room scene itself. Michelle confirms they're from the offshore by noticing that they have vaccine scars on their arms. The fact that two people have dirt on their shoes is a great clue found by Fernando, suggesting that two of the people are guests, as is the realization that the hostess's facial expression is different from the others. Raphael correctly incorporates cultural and social information into his interpretation by pointing out that the offshore would never represent a murder in a story set there. That narrows down the possibilities to something accidental or natural. Instead of telling everyone Fernando's answer is completely wrong and he an idiot, Raphael could have phrased it better by pointing out the additional pieces of evidence that disagree with Fernando's guess. The next challenge puts seven candidates in a box with six coins. They're given 15 minutes to choose who among them should be eliminated. If they can't decide, they'll all be eliminated. The process of elimination is up to the group, but they're told they'll do the next challenge as a team, so they should pick wisely. Raphael tries to keep coins to himself, saying the others can fight over the rest, but Marco fights him for it. They try to eliminate him as a cheat, but he reminds them that they wouldn't be there had he not solved the last challenge. Fernando votes for Joanna, but Joanna gestures to Raphael about a secret allegiance they formed earlier, and in retaliation, he votes for Fernando because of his wheelchair and physical inability to complete possible challenges. Fernando uses the group's pity against them to help keep himself in the game. He tells the others if they eliminate him, they'll be taking away his chance to ever walk again. They decide to tear up a scarf and pull for long pieces. Whoever gets the shortest piece will be eliminated. Joanna loses, but when the administrator comes to ask for the loser, she reveals she kept a coin to herself. Our five candidates avoid elimination, and a player named Lucas is eliminated instead. Five challenges remain between them and the offshore. There's several strategies you can use here to help keep yourself in the game. Raphael tries the most obvious strategy. He takes a coin and refuses to give it up. This is risky because he's already on thin ice with the others, who partially hold his future in their hands. The second most obvious strategy is to take several coins and give all but one coin back. Keep one for yourself and don't parade that fact in front of everyone. Then keep your distance from the other players so they can't take it from you. Another strategy would be to point out the other's flaws the way Fernando does. But this antagonizes other people in your group, and you have to have held a good reputation with the others in your group for this to work. Another strategy is to appeal to their emotions and pity like Fernando does. This is a pretty safe strat. The riskier option is to try a Hail Mary play. The rules said that they had to decide who was eliminated, but they also said only those holding a coin would be allowed to continue. They could try letting two people hold on to one coin and then tell the administrator 
script that they decided nobody should be eliminated. The random selection of scarf pieces is probably the fairest selection process possible, as it relies mostly on blind luck, which is objective and unbiased. If you're gonna go with the fair option, at the very least, put the seven coins on the floor in the center of the room and then only let those who pull a long scarf take one. This would prevent Joanna from keeping a coin to herself. Of course, even this blind luck strategy is cheatable. If you see long strands that are not twisted on the farthest outside stacked against each other, you would know that the second from the outside is the long one. You cannot trust the closest to the outside because in the hand, the short one can be on the outside of the hand, but not hanging below. You can also accidentally grab two when you first go to pull the scarves. If one has less resistance than the other, it's likely much smaller and has less area to be grabbed. Finally, if you lose and don't have a coin, just be prepared to deck someone and take their coin from them. For their next challenge, the group of six is told that they have to walk down a dark tunnel together as a team. They have five minutes to reach the other end. Once the door closes, odorless gas fills the tunnel, causing fear-inducing hallucinations, immediately separating them into their worst nightmares. Juana makes it across first, but is told that they can only succeed as a group. She goes back for the others and tries to warn them about the gas. Only a couple are able to listen. Listen. With seconds to spare, she drags Agatha down the tunnel by her leg and convinces Raphael to follow her even though he doesn't trust her. Our five candidates yet again pass the challenge. That's the fifth challenge down with four more to go. Before they entered the tunnel, the group noticed that an eliminated candidate had wet herself after trying to get through the tunnel, while the other eliminated players seemed fine. I would assume the tunnel is scary, but not dangerous. Since this is an all-for-one type of challenge, I would put Fernando at the front with his wheelchair, then form a chain holding hands to move through the tunnel as fast as our slowest teammate, which is technically Fernando. We don't know how long the tunnel is, so we have to assume it might take us most of the five minutes to get through and move quickly from the start. Staying together also makes it possible to defend against anything that might attack us or slow us down. Even with the hallucinations, they should still be able to remember the ultimate goal of this challenge, reach the end of the tunnel. They should also know that that's the only way to stop whatever's happening in the tunnel. It doesn't matter what the guy next to me claims he knows about my past bad behavior. We need that asshole to get us to the next round. Next, the candidates are guided to a series of dorm rooms set up in a storage section of the building. When they wake up, they find the doors are all sealed. Marco pulls a lever in their room and finds a projection of ones and zeros on one of the hallway walls. He tells everyone the ones and zeros correspond to the levers in each of the dorm rooms. He tells them they'll need to work together to solve the puzzle. Eight runners plus three people in each room to pull the levers plus Marco means we're down to our last 33 candidates. The eight runners tell people waiting in the rooms the order of each room's levers. Zero means leave the lever alone. One means pull the lever down, and they have to do it before a new sequence appears on the wall. Everyone pulls together and successfully completes the sequence, but instead of letting them out, the admins release one pack of food and one container of water into the chute besides the wall. The candidates argue about who should get it, and Michelle convinces them to do it alphabetically so it's fair. They're forced to pull the levers over and over and over again until each person gets a food and water packet, and still, the exit remains locked. Even though it's technically the same location, because the admins changed the rules here, I'm counting this as its own challenge. Our five starter candidates are still alive, and they have three more challenges to go. This is a stamina and coordination challenge. Marco organizes this well to begin with, but he assumes that they only need to do this once. Once they receive one parcel of food and water for all that work, however, they need to change their strategy to avoid exhaustion, since they will need to complete this 32 more times to feed everyone. We can't afford to mess up the numbers even a few times, especially when exhaustion sets in. Memorizing is just too risky. Instead, each runner needs to just hold up their hands. One means keep a finger up. Zero means put a finger down. Replicate the code on your fingers and you can easily convey the information without mixing up numbers. We also need to be as efficient as possible when pulling levers to not wear ourselves out. Everyone's pulling the levers with their arms when they need to be pulling with their legs more. If they can use their legs by pushing on the steel behind the levers while putting their full body weight on top of it, it'll be more effective. They need to squat behind the bars on the top of the lever platform and then get their feet on the wall to push 
down. They should also use multiple people on one lever, one to push, one to pull. This will be far faster and easier than having one person just struggling on each lever. Another strategy is to take turns pulling levers rather than having all three people pull levers every single time. If one person pulls all the levers one round, then the next person pulls all the levers the next round. This increases the amount of recovery time between rounds of exertion and prevents wiping out candidates completely before they've had a chance to eat. The other option here that they never try is using a metal bar from one of the beds to break open the locks on many of the locked storage rooms on this floor. They could be empty, booby-trapped, or filled with food, but they'll never know if they don't try opening one. These are simple padlocks. If one person puts tension on the U-locking loop by pulling on it, and another repeatedly bangs on the locking mechanism with a metal pull hard enough, it should dislodge the pins enough for the loop to slip open. Once everyone's been fed, the administrators change up the challenge by dropping all the food and water down the chute at once. Michelle manages to get everyone to share by suggesting they let her sort it all first, which ends with all them getting three packets of food and water each. Marco tells Raphael that the change signals a change in the game, that they have to find a way out of the storage facility. Marco and Raphael gather several of the bigger guys and manage to wedge open one of the doors, but behind it, there's another gate. Frustrated, everyone gives up. Why did they just give up right there? For all they know, the next gate is the last one that they have to open. Now that they've opened one, they should gather some of the better rested candidates to the door with even more metal bars, double or triple up on the wedge that's holding the gate open, and then begin using their collective leverage again on the second gate. If they had done this, everyone would have made it out of this test alive. Instead, things get Lord of the Flies very quickly. Furious that his plan to open the door didn't work, Marco forms a gang of the strongest players and bullies the other candidates for their food and water, believing that the entire process test is meant to separate the elite from the ordinary. He begins stealing from everyone and then trapping people in dorms. Michelle tells her group they have to defend themselves. Meanwhile, Joanna looks for a way out. She finds Agatha sleeping in the hallway and takes her shoes. She puts them on her hands and then climbs up the food chute. Michelle and her group create a barricade to keep Marco and his gang out, while Marco terrorizes a group of the female candidates. When when one hides food, he hits her with a metal bar, killing her. Raphael confronts Marco, painting a target on his back. Marco and his group of four goons chases him throughout the facility, threatening to kill him. Raphael begs Michelle to let him in, but she won't until he whispers something to her. The barricade starts to fail. After a pep talk from Ezekiel, Joanna returns, finds a metal bar, sneaks up on Marco's goon and knocks him out. Then, she lets out the people Marco locked up. They all swarm his gang and nearly beat them to death, until Joanna stops them. A siren sounds and the gate opens. Of the fallen, only Marco gets up and tries to reach the exit, almost getting through the gate, before he's crushed by the closing door. Of our five starting candidates, four pass this challenge. Marco simply wasn't up to the task. In total, eight of the 33 remaining players are eliminated, leaving us with 25, which is technically fewer than 3% of the original 1,000 players. The admin could call this test right now, but that would be too easy. There's a couple of strategies we could employ here. It simply comes down to this, avoid Marco or kill Marco. I think the best option is to avoid Marco. Building a barricade is a temporary solution that encourages conflict. He'll see the barricade as a threat to his elite status. Even if they gave him their food and water, he would likely tear it down just to send a message. The first way to avoid Marco is to climb up the food chute like Joanna does. Looking into the pipe, we can see that there are four inch tack welds on two sides. A single unfused tack weld can hold over 200 pounds. Four of them will easily be able to hold any candidate's weight. Start having people climb up one at a time. The lips on the vents will create easy finger and footholds. We don't know what they'll do if everyone begins climbing out, but that is the simplest way out of here. The second way to avoid Marco is to try breaking the lock on an unnumbered storage room, and then hide inside, shutting the door behind us. The third way to avoid Marco is to rush for the open gate, let ourselves into the hallway beyond, and then remove the wedge holding it open. This strategy does trap us in the tunnel, but if we brought enough metal bars, we could try to work on opening the far gate. The last option is to maneuver around Marco's gang and make our way to the group of candidates Marco's already stolen from. With numbers, we can overpower them. For their eighth challenge, the remaining candidates are given their own rooms, filled with pictures of their family from the neighborhood. The lights switch on, and those with living family find one of their family members in the room with them. Fernando 
Leo's father is there and tells him that this is another test. The process brings in candidate's family members to try and tempt the candidates to quit and go home. To sweeten the deal, they get to take a box full of money with them if they quit. Fernando suggests it's enough to build a new house and start fresh, but his dad won't hear it. He tells his son he can pass and be happy and healthy offshore, or he can quit, but he won't be welcome back home. Because Michelle doesn't have any family, an administrator enters her room and tells her that she has 30 minutes to decide whether she'll return to inland with the money or continue to the next challenge. Joanna is drugged in her room by a guy from inland who knows that she's not really Joanna and has come to take her back to answer for murdering a neighborhood criminal's son. He offers her a deal. Either he can kill her and collect the bounty on her head, or they can walk out of there together with the money, which he'll keep in exchange for her life. When she chooses the second option, the man unties her and she attacks him and tries to leave. He pins her to the ground and only lets her up when she tells him she just wants to pass and go to the offshore. The man releases her and tells her he's actually working for Ezekiel, who wanted to test her desire to go to offshore. If she wants to reinvent herself as Juana, then they're happy to accept her as Juana. Raphael, whose name is really Tiago, finds his pregnant mom in his room. She knows he stole his brother Raphael's identity to take part in the process a second time. She tells him he's coming home with the money. When he refuses, she threatens to tell the administrators that he's a fraud. He tells her that if she does, he'll say it was her idea and get the rest of the family banned from ever being allowed to enter the process again. The simplest solution here is to ignore your family, leave the room, and tell the administrator you're staying. This prevents manipulative or distracting conversations, threats, or emotional vulnerability from hurting our chances. Going home with a consolation prize like this might seem worth it. That is, if we have any hope of defending it. Michelle has no family back home to help protect our huge jar of coins. Raphael's family would likely squander their money if it wasn't also stolen. Fernando won't have his father's support support if he returns to the slum. His father is a popular pastor back home and without his support, Fernando's likely to lose the money anyways due to the rampant crime in the neighborhood. Joanna has a bounty on her head. She'd be dead anyways, money or not. Taking the prize money just won't do much good. Our four remaining candidates choose to stay in the process, leaving them just one more challenge to pass. The candidates are told to expect individual tests now. Michelle's individual test is to convince Bruna's parents to sign their younger daughter up for the process, after telling them Bruna has died. They're devastated when she tells them a lie about how Bruna died in a freak accident. In order to convince them to put their younger daughter through these tests, she tells them that her own brother was murdered when he went through the process. But she didn't seek revenge. She passed the tests and now lives a good life, and their younger daughter can too. In the end, they agree to register their younger daughter, and Michelle passes her test. This is brutal. The administrator has essentially sandbagged her here, but Michelle should realize when she's told what her test is that it's really a test of her loyalty, given her earlier interrogation with Bruna. There was no way Michelle could have known the parents she was going to be talking to were Bruna's, or that she herself would have to break the news to them about her death, so there wasn't any time to prepare a story ahead of time. Still, making one up on the spot can lead to obvious plot holes or missing details when thought about long enough. The best lies usually mimic the truth, so slightly changing an honest experience will help Michelle keep her lie straight. For example, in the previous test, an innocent girl was killed by Marco hitting her in the head with a metal bar. Just tell the parents this, but say that the girl was unfortunately Bruna. I would try to avoid bringing up my brother at all costs, to avoid drawing more attention to myself or my history. I would also avoid it because it's harder to encourage behavior you want to see by associating it with negative outcomes, like dying horrible. Michelle is basically saying not only did their daughter die, but her brother did too, and likely a lot more did and will. Instead, I might try telling them that Bruna wouldn't stop bragging to the other candidates that her little sister was going to excel at all her tests, and that her last words were about her dream of her sister making it to the offshore and making the world a better place for everyone. This puts pressure on Bruna's parents to fulfill their daughter's dying wish, and positively reinforces that even though things didn't work out for Bruna, 
she still had faith in the process and wanted it for her sister. Fernando's individual challenge is to review previous records of the process and devise a new test for candidates. He has 30 minutes. When his time ends, he tells the administrator that his test would change the family challenge they did earlier that day. Instead of people knowing it's a test or being based on money, they're presented with an emotional reason to quit the game and go home without knowing whether it's true or not. For example, your father is on his deathbed. This is your last chance to see him. If they're willing to give up their chance for the offshore, they're eliminated. Fernando passes his challenge. It's hard to know if a test will be new or not if you don't know what tests have already been used before. And as Fernando says, 30 minutes wouldn't be enough time to go over all the previous tests from the process. It would still be a good idea to think of something as a backup plan in case his test modification plan wasn't considered good enough to pass. Ultimately, we've seen two types of challenges so far, mechanical skill tests and social experiments. Mechanical skill tests are probably easier to create, but less impressive. The social experiments really all seem designed to test how badly a candidate wants to make it offshore, or to see if they have leadership skills. In that sense, I might suggest a social experiment in which a candidate picks the worst possible team for their competition, and then have the candidate assigned to that team for the next challenge. Just make sure that anything you suggest, you're capable of doing, because they may give it to you. Raphael's individual test is to trigger projections of the founding couple of Offshore on opposite walls at 6 p.m. that evening. The only problem is, the switches for the images are on opposite ends of a very large hall. In order to pass, he'll have to get someone to help him. Raphael tries to convince several eliminated players to help, and Joanna, but none will. He comes clean to Fernando about being part of the resistance group, The Cause, but also tells him that Michelle is too, and if he won't help him pass the test, he'll tell the administrator she's a part of the cause. Fernando agrees and helps him pass. Outing himself and Michelle to Fernando was extremely risky, especially since he's hoping Fernando's love for Michelle will win out over his belief in the process, something that's been brainwashed into him since he was a kid. He could have told Fernando that only Michelle was part of the cause, and he'll give her up if he doesn't help. The problem is, this only makes him look like more of an untrustworthy asshole, and lessens the credibility of his claims. After all, if he's not part of the cause, how does he know she is? A softer option is to tell Fernando that the individual tests are not individual. The administrators of the test only said they were. Raphael could lie and say that if Fernando doesn't help him press the other button, Michelle will be eliminated. This doesn't implicate anyone, doesn't make Raphael look like a self-serving asshole, and has plausible deniability, since nobody would know Raphael's actual game. Fernando would not risk getting Michelle eliminated, so he'd have to cooperate. Alternatively, he could have simply told Joanna he stole his brother's identification marker. It's the truth. The process is already selecting for this type of behavior, as evidence of him passing the cube game by stealing. And Joanna herself is ethically lacking, and would probably appreciate his motivation. In my opinion, Fernando is the better option, as we actually have leverage over him. Joanna gains nothing from helping him considering she thinks all the rest of the tests will be individual. After all the remaining candidates pass their individual tests, a welcome reception is thrown for them. Seeking revenge against her brother, Michelle slips through the crowd and attempts to use the poison she smuggled in under her skin to kill Ezekiel, the man who murdered her brother. Unfortunately, his drink gets switched with another guy who dies instead. An investigation begins. Unfortunately for Michelle, there was surveillance of her lacing his drink. She's tortured for information, then shown video footage of her brother living offshore. Ezekiel tells her that the resistance group used her. Instead of killing her, he tells her he'll take her offshore, where she can see her brother again, but that they'll have to reprogram her first. Michelle agrees. Michelle has a terrible case of wrong time and bad cleanup syndrome. Her craving for violence has caused pointless death and suffering for no good reason. Her mission with the resistance group was to infiltrate offshore and take it apart from the inside. That's much easier to do once she actually reaches the offshore. Even if she does kill Ezekiel now, he'll just be replaced and she'll get executed. She wants to get revenge and the best way to do that is to destroy the offshore. Killing the director does very little in the grand scheme of things. 
More than that, her personal revenge is so much easier to achieve on offshore, where she'd be free to kill Ezekiel whenever she wanted, and when she wouldn't be suspected. He doesn't live at the processing facility. He lives offshore at all times, except when he runs the tests for new candidates. There's likely thousands of people living offshore, a much bigger pool of suspects. Whether Ezekiel is lying about her brother being alive or not is irrelevant. She'd be able to know for sure once she got there. Beyond all that, what idiot taught Miss Shelley how to dispose evidence? Anyone could find the capsule down below, especially since this is such a pristine place with little to no litter on the ground. It would stick out like a sore thumb. It's also now directly below where the poisoning took place, making it even more likely to be linked with the event. It's covered in Miss Shelley's and now Raphael's fingerprints, and probably still contains trace amounts of poison within it. It's a cluster of evidence to who and what killed the processor. There are a few ways that she could have disposed of the capsule better. She could immediately excuse herself to the bathroom and flush it, or she could shove it into one of the potted plant centerpieces on the buffet table after wiping the fingerprints. Or, Michelle could attach the capsule to Fernando's wheelchair, which is made with trash and would disguise well. Or, she could slip it into someone else's pocket, maybe an agent's pocket when they're not looking. Fernando is told Michelle was eliminated when he wakes up in the morning. He immediately quits the process and is left outside the facility to make his way home alone. He's told he failed his own emotional weakness test and is no longer worthy of the offshore. Fernando's final challenge was to become the guinea pig for the new game he designed. He snapped due to his own emotional weakness and impulsiveness. Why make such a rush decision? Candidates have been whisked off to new challenges throughout the whole process. For all he knows, she's just off doing another test. He should have honestly seen this coming, or at least recognized it as the very test he designed, and avoided the temptation of falling for it. I mean, he could quit at any point later on before leaving for offshore, if Michelle really was eliminated. Raphael and Joanne are led to the final test, called a purification ritual. It's the true offshore initiation in which candidates are sterilized to prevent heredity from being the thing that keeps humanity going. Instead, merit through the process keeps humanity alive. Raphael is shaken. All he's talked about is wanting kids. But in the end, he finally agrees. Whether this is because of the plan of the resistance group or not is left hanging. Meanwhile, Joanna is pulled from the ritual and taken to meet Ezekiel, who has one more test for her. He shows her a captured man, one who had previously assaulted her back home. Ezekiel tells her he believes she's special and can work with him to protect offshore, if she's willing to kill the captive by pressing a red button. When she refuses, he calls her worthless. Realizing that even the utopian elite sterilize, manipulate, and kill people, she decides she doesn't want to be a part of the 3% anymore. She laughs at him and shames him for lacking humanity. He eliminates her and kills the man anyways. She leaves the facility and takes Fernando with her. This is gonna sound heartless, but that guy is gonna die whether we push that button or not. Just press the button. Did you forget that a gang wants you degraded and dead, Joanna? There's elitist maniacs everywhere. It's how you deal with them that matters. At least offshore, they have amazing healthcare and cool fruit snacks. The sterilization thing does suck. Just depends on whether you even have a life to go back to, I guess. In Joanna's case, that's a hard no. Ultimately, with our expert guidance, Michelle would be on her way to dismantle the offshore from within with Fernando, Rafael, and Joanna by her side. Hell, even Marco would have made it offshore. For 97% of the candidates taking part in these tests, the elimination games remain unbeaten. For the rest of us who watched Nerd Explains and started practicing for success in the tests long before the process even began, these tests would have been definitely beaten. How would you have beaten the process? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button to save an inlander's life. Hit the subscribe button to save your own. Thanks for watching, and remember, you each create your own merit.